you get the natural language? Here are some ways to use it. Note well. <laughs> Is is the Opus RFC still the largest RFC in terms of bytes? I don't know. Yeah. I, I I think it was at the time. In terms of, probably not in terms of stages, but bytes. But bytes. Yes. <laughs> No, it's okay. We have the first, the first standard to be defined in the GA Seen that earlier this week? Yeah, he's doing the please rotate the device. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, how did you get that to go away on yours? Made the window bigger. Oh, making the window bigger fixed it for him previously. Full screen it, maybe? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know at that point. Control Alt minus and try to reduce your font size. <laughs> that did it. Okay. All right. On that subject. Yeah. I can't make this bigger. That did not. Okay, that's bad. That is as big as I can go. It's done. All right. <laughs> I think All right, I think we can begin. Uh, welcome to the first meeting of the ML Codec Working Group. If you're not expecting to be in the ML Codec Working Group, you are in the wrong place. Uh, standard ITF note well applies, uh, and people uh, should be aware. Um, make sure that the, you log into the data tracker to be entered in for the blue sheet functionality. I, it looks like everyone here probably is based on the counts. Uh, do we have uh, a note taker for the meeting today? I believe we do, right? Okay. Uh, is someone willing to act as a Zulip relay to relay comments into the room from Zulip? Another notebook is also welcome. Oh, 
Okay. That'll work. Okay, so the agenda as currently set. Um, we'll be discussing, uh, Jean-Marc will be presenting uh, Opus extension mechanisms. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a, a consensus call to adopt that as a working group document. Um, and then, then we'll, Jan will discuss the speech coding enhancements draft. And then Jean-Marc will discuss the uh, deep redundancy draft. Uh, is there any agenda bashing? Okay. All right. Okay, go ahead. You may. Okay. So I'm presenting a proposal for an extension mechanism for Opus that would be used to implement some of the changes we're proposing, including deep redundancy. Uh, name of the draft is Draft Valen Opus Extension, currently at zero one. Next slide, please. So the goals we have here for this extension mechanism, obviously we want to support all of the goals we set ourselves for the working group. We want to have that while maintaining full compatibility forwards and backwards with the original specification. We want to make it possible um, to do all that signaling, this extension signaling in band, like the rest of uh, the way, the rest of the uh, Opus works. And there's some trade off to do here between you know, uh, future proofing to be able to extend it while at the same time making sure it's as efficient as possible. We're, you know, this is a codec we're trying to compress as much as possible. So the proposed solution we have is to transmit all of these extensions within Opus padding. The, um, what that implies is there's no changes to any of the other bits of Opus. Everything goes into the padding. And it also ensures that the extensions will be ignored by the older encoders that don't implement the extensions, but it's not going to break them. Um, next slide. Um, and by the way, if you have any comments, you can you know, go through the mic. No need to wait for the end. Um, so quickly, why, uh, just an explanation as to why comp uh, the compatibility would be preserved in this case. Um, reading from RFC 6716, the Opus RFC, essentially it says that on the encoder side, the additional padding bytes must be zero. That's what all implementations we know about do. And the, on the decoder side, it says the decoder must accept any value for the padding bytes. And so based on this, as long as we ensure that when we use this new version of Opus, all uh, padding is still interpreted as zeros. But, I mean, sorry. If the padding is all zeros, it gets still interpreted as padding, then we should have uh, compatibility both ways. Um, next slide. So this is the proposed format. <clears throat> Uh, for the extension. What we are proposing is to have essentially a concatenation of extensions if there is more than one extension in the, the padding bytes. No table of contents or any of that, just a bunch of extensions one after the other. Every extension would start with an 8-bit header. <clears throat> this header would contain a 7-bit unique ID for the extension and a one-bit flag that we call the L flag here. And that L flag along with the ID would control whether there is an optional length, um, an optional length byte or sequence of bytes. And those would signal how many bytes of payload uh, follow for the extension. Uh, next slide. Oh, is there a comment? I'm oh, sorry, it's a pain in the ass to get the, this tool to work. 
uh, small enough firm, so hopefully we don't have to use the tool. Um, one comment on the ex uh, length extension. A lot of the other ITF work is kind of uh, using variants to uh, to support um, you know variable length uh, lengths. So maybe it's a good idea. It reduces one more bit. So if you think you're going to have roughly 128 extensions, your approach works better. But if you think you may only have a few, like 64 or less, and a potential of even even more, then aligning on the variance may be a, you know, more consistent with a lot of the other drafts. Okay, I would <clears throat> need to read more about that. It's just um, it's just two, two bits of uh, two bits of uh, size, you know, two bits of size saying whether it's one byte, uh, two bytes, or four bytes, or eight bytes. We're probably never going to have the eight byte variant, so <clears throat> that doesn't make sense. But oh, you mean for the extension ID itself? You have a you have an extension ID that's seven bits and then an yep. optional extension, right? And an optional more than seven bits, right? Oh, no, no, the, the length is for the payload of the extension. The ID says which extension, for example, for Dread, we would have like its extension ID 32. Oh, oh and then L, L goes bits... with payload length, not the ID length. No, no, the payload length. Okay. The ID length is fixed to seven, Okay. at least in this proposal. You're confident that, that that fixed length will encapsulate all possible extensions? Um, if we really run into problems, then we can have an extension that says, you know, here's another one. But right now we're at three. So, okay. oh. and it's been 10 years. So I think 128 should be good for a few centuries. <laughs> but, you know. Okay. We can... Unless like people suddenly had like tons of ideas and you know we need to use more, but for now it seems reasonable. But you know. But you're 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 pointing out that it's that our hands aren't tied in the future if more extensions are needed because there are ways to address that. So if, if we really needed some more extensions, then we would have an option to define, you know, extension ID 120 that says more something else mm -hmm. yeah. so we're it, we're not completely locking ourselves out okay no, that's fine that works um yeah next slide i'm trying so to make sure that you know we can add future extensions and that future decoders can just skip the extensions they don't know uh, we essentially have to predefine the behavior of the um, length encoding for all IDs, even if we've not assigned them. So um, this is the way we propose to have this work. Uh, ID zero essentially remains padding because we need all zeros to keep the padding definition. And in that case, L equals zero will need will mean that the rest of the pad of the original opus padding is still opus padding. So essentially you have a sequence of all zeros in that case. We map L equals one for ID zero to mean that <clears throat> this single byte was padding and there's no length that follows no payload. So in other words, you can use a, a byte equal to one to do as much padding as you like. So this padding is kind of a special case. Otherwise, IDs 1 to 31 are reserved for what we would call short extensions. In that case, L equals zero mean that there is, ab there is no length or and no payload. So essentially it's just signaling like a flag uh, in that case. And L equals one would mean there's a single byte of payload that follows. Uh, so for extensions that only need eight bits. Uh, that's for small extensions. For larger extensions, uh, IDs 32 to 127. Then L equals zero would mean the rest of the padding is used for that extension. There is no extension that follows that. And L equals one in that case is the only case where we would actually signal a length. Um, and the signaling would essentially be the number of bytes. And if you use 255, then the number of bytes is 254 plus the byte that follows. And you can have as many of these 255 codes as you like. Uh, okay. 
now in terms of assigning these IDs, so as I mentioned earlier, ID zero would be the original padding. ID one would be a special frame separator because Opus makes it possible to put several, several frames in a packet. You can have a packet up to 120 milliseconds, meaning you could have six 20 millisecond frames in that bigger packet. So if you want extensions that are associated with one frame or another, you need a way to, you need a delimiter, um, you need a separator between those. So ID one would be the separator. You would, for example, code one extension, you put in the separator, another extension and so on. Um, so this is for ID one, uh, two to 119, uh, would be assigned through standards action policy. Uh, in other words, at least our current thought is not to have like some kind of first come first serve because this is, you know, Opus is not really a transport protocol. We need to be careful when extending it. Uh, if you create extensions, you want to really check that it doesn't interfere with other extensions because it's all related to, ex you know, the same code base, the same decoder. So at this point, the thought is we probably want um, <clears throat> we probably want you know a working group or some kind of ITF action where we really check that this is um, done right, and then um, we would reserve eight IDs for just like experiment purposes, so that for example when we do this uh, dread implementation, um, we can start experimenting with it deploying it in limited circumstances without getting problems once it's finalized. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Harold. Yeah, Harold. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Harold. If you want to follow tradition from other places, reserve one to seven for when you run out of bytes. We can do that as well. We would just need to change the existing code base that uses 127 for the experimental dread stuff, but <clears throat> it's not deployed, so we're good. Um, next slide. So, in terms of SDP, um, the idea would have would be to have these um, generic parameters, uh, extensions, and sprop extensions respectively for the receive side and the sender side, and just have a list of supported extensions for the sender and the receiver. So like just a comma separated list of numbers. And then each extension could define its own <clears throat> specific parameters uh, using ext n dash whatever the name is required for that particular extension. Uh, Mozanai, sorry, my tool's not working still. Um, the These are negotiated parameters, or this just declarative? Um, since there's no interoperability problem, you just declare everything you can send and receive, but yes. there's no negotiation down to anything? Yeah, it would be basically declarative. It would be treated exactly like the original Opus parameters uh, for, you know, uh, bandwidth and... Right now in the SDP for Opus, you can say, you know, uh, sampling rate 16 kilohertz means, you know, I'd rather receive 16, but if someone sends me 48, I'm still gonna be able to decode it. This is how it's currently defined in the uh, Opus payload format. It's kind of, uh, you know, for example, like to take a practical example with Dread, it would be something like saying, you know, I support Dread. I have a jitter buffer that can go up to half a second. Don't bother sending me longer than that. But if you do, I'll still be able to handle it. Okay, so there won't be any normative language that based on offer answer semantics, you end up doing this. It'll just be up to implementations to decide what they want to send or, or, or what they want to enable receiving because there's no actual rules and there's no interoperability problem. Yeah, so it, it, all, all of this is for like optimization purposes. 
You know, maybe I'm sending the same packets to a bunch of people and, you know, some of them, I want to send the same packet. Some of them can support 48, some 16. I might as well send 48 to all of them. Uh, like th essentially the intent is to do exactly the same thing we did for all the other parameters in, um, in the RTP payload format. Okay. I, I can't remember the exact language, but I remember that exact discussion being brought up and I can't remember the exact details, but what it came down to was essentially treating those as, you know, I, I can decode it. Like the way the decoder works, the decoder can always decode anything you send it. Mm -hmm. So it's just about not being wasteful. Like I'm going to play this out on a single speaker. If you send me stereo, it's going to be wasteful, but I'm going to have a look. It may be useful to mention in, in the draft that, that these extensions are purely uh, declarative, but uh, the individual extensions themselves, when they register their extension, they may have you know requirements about incompatibility with other extensions or something like that, or rule, r more rules than this generic draft will would allow. Yeah, I think that would be kind of an interesting one if an extension showed up that <clears throat> if you enabled it, it would cause you to break something like that would be like different from any of the other opus behavior. So I'm not no, sure. But I'm, I'm sure there'll be that. some extensions that are mutually exclusive that are competing and you would never turn them on both at the same time. So there would be some rules in those extensions say, I am incompatible with this other extension. Don't ever turn us both on at the same time. I will defeat this other extension or we'll defeat each other if you, if you do it. So it's fine for the generic draft yeah, to yeah. say that these are just declarative, but there may be, uh, further rules by the extension, you know, specs themselves. Yeah, I'm not, I would be open to the, you know, like proposals on language for that. Um, the, definitely one, um, it's from the next slide, but one of the open questions uh, maybe related slightly to that was whether we wanted to define, um, I think it was from this, um, UDP options draft that defined these um, unsafe extensions, telling decoders, you know, if you don't know about these extensions, you must ignore all extensions. So I don't know if it's useful in that case or not. Um, open to comments. Sorry. Jonathan, comments. Oh, uh, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. Um, I just uh, wanted to. Observe, I know the design of the parameter names for the extensions were designed such that you could forward parameters without knowing about them. But I, on further reflection, I think that's not true. At least if you're like an SFU, I mean, forwarding them like just one to one, obviously you can do, but forwarding, like if you're an SFU trying to aggregate them, you have to know their semantics. Like, you know, yes, the dread parameter, you have to do the max across all of them or something like that. Or any, there's no way to do generic aggregation of these parameters as far as I know. Yeah, the original intent was not so much about the forwarding, but mm -hmm. just like <clears throat> imposing some kind of order in it. So, yes, I guess structure so they don't overlap, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I realized that it would not be like a, a, a kind of a perfect solution for. Yeah, so my, um, yeah to, to most point, I think uh, the confusing part with um, as far as I remember with Opus is that it basically says, I can do this. And as you said, like the receiver always needs to be able to handle it. I'm wondering if that actually with the extensions will work or will we get to a point where the sender basically says, I can do extension 55, but the receiver is basically like, no, don't do that. Like Jonathan was saying something similar. It's like- Well, for we... extensions, the decoder is always free to ignore the extension. Maybe it's something we should, we should spell out, but none of the extension should mandate something in part because of that, of, you know, compatibility with the existing decoder, like the existing decoder will see, so then you, then you here's would be, padding, let me throw that away. So yeah. then that would result in the in sender potentially like activating the extensions and kind of wasting bits on the wire because the receiver couldn't handle it basically. <laughs> Yeah, the, the point of this extensions list is just to not waste resources. Yeah, but, that, but that's what you're, what, like you, the sender would say like, I support like these five extensions. Yep. Um, and I think in, in Opus right now, that basically means that he's also going to activate all five of these because the receiver doesn't have, actually have a way to tell him like, hey, 
out of these five, please turn only on these two because the other three I don't understand. Well, the, the way this would typically work is, you know, for example, I would say I support just this one extension and you tell me you support a bunch of extensions, but from seeing that I only support that one, you're probably not going to bother with the other ones. But so the, the sender uh, yes, side, yeah, yeah, I have for, to... for the, for the, for the, for the receiving side. Yes. But what I was saying, like, basically if the, the offerer basically says, here's like, as I said, like five different extensions. Um, and the, uh, right now, I think in, in Opus, basically the, the, the receiver doesn't have a way to, I think that's where most confusion was coming from that normally in an offer answer, you have a, the receiver has a way to say like, like, don't do that. Like I, like, I don't well, understand you, 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 this or like don't turn this on right and like i think in opus with how things are uh, specified right now it, it's always basically like the sender will basically tell it like i have these five extensions i'm going to send you them anyway because you have no way of turning them off you will feel free to ignore them which no then... no sorry that, that is not at least that is not the intended semantics okay. of this the intended semantic is more like you're telling me you're able to support that i'm telling you this is sorry you're able to send that I'm telling you I'm able to receive that. So normally if things work correctly, like you will take the intersection of both unless you somehow have to send me this because you're sending the same packet to someone else. Mm -hmm. But otherwise you will say, okay, this so guy doesn't like I only... understand that. So I'm not going to send it. But on the other hand, like if I support this extension and you tell me you're, you're you going to send, send it, it to me, then I'm going to be prepared to... And, you, to decode you're, it. and you're going to mirror it back basically in your list of the extensions, kind of like I'm <clears throat> willing to do this extension. Or like, you know, for example, if I say I support <clears throat> Dread on, on the receive side and you tell me you don't on the sender side, I'm not going to bother initialize the Dread decoders because I am going to assume you're not going to send it to me. Okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I forgot about the last slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so some of the things that, you know, wasn't clear which way to go, you know, I took some guesses in the, in the draft as to uh, these answers, but, you know, I'm kind of willing to go the other way. Um, uh, one open question was, you know, should we allow or how should we handle repeated IDs for the same frame in a packet? like coding extension number 35 twice for the same frame in the same packet? Does it have a meaning or should we disallow it? Or sh does the order, should we keep the order or does the order make any sense? Um, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Uh, that was one. Um, so the general ordering of extensions, if I code extension 35 before extension 50, or if I code 50 before 35, should it matter or not? In other words, like should a, if, a, if there's like a middle box that's gonna deal with extensions, does it need to guarantee it preserves the order or can it do whatever it pleases? Sorry. Yeah, uh, John Flanix, yeah, I think for the repeat ID, my inclination would be to say, in principle, it's allowed, but only if a specific extension allows it. They just, I mean, the, the, you know, if you, if for generic ones, because it can happen any number of times, but for any specific one, if it should, exp it should have to explicitly say, you can send me t multiple times and this is what it means. And for, if, it, if an extension doesn't say that, it means no, don't do that. This is a case where perhaps the, the draft should list some cases where the, the extensions need to define certain semantics. Like yeah, there might extension. be sort of like a, a, a template of what, what extensions need to yeah. talk about. For the, Ordering, I mean, my worry. Sorry, sorry ju yes. just to make sure I understand. So the proposal would be for the extensions draft to say, by default, you should never have the same ID unless the draft defining that ID specifically says that it's allowed for. Yeah. yeah. But that means that for an extension you don't know, it could happen multiple times and just deal with it. So. Yeah, okay. So the SFU would need to say, okay, yeah. I. 
yeah, it's exactly. allowed. Okay, that, that, that yeah. is the main question. Yeah, for the ordering, I mean, that's hard to know until we start getting into like, specifically my worry is things like extensions on extensions, like, you know, this is a tweak. I mean, this is a tweak on this part of the waveform and this is a further tweak on that part of the waveform or something and a tweak on a tweak. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I'd say probably leave it alone, but I don't know. I'd have to, and I guess the interesting thing is could an SFU partially strip extensions, like if it knows that receiver one is take, understands one, two, three, four, and receiver two only understands three, could it strip the other ones? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. Okay. All right, I'm going to close the queue in a minute. We have one more comment here, and then if anyone yeah. else. Uh, François Nguyen. Uh, first time here, so maybe it doesn't make any sense, but is it possible that the extension is treated as a toggle? If it doesn't have any any values and it modifies the way the next extension is being treated, and then after that you want to have the same extension again to say, okay, now it's going back to disabled, and further extension would be treated differently. Again. Oh, to have defining an extension to have like a, a, a change of change behavior of for the next extensions. Yes. Uh, my general so the text currently doesn't say anything about that. My general idea is it would be. A terrible thing to do because RTP, because you I, I, toggle something and then the packet got lost and it would. I think this was within a packet, not what? within, not within, within the, the list of extension. Of, yeah. Oh, within this, um, in some sense, the, the separator extension does something similar to that. Yeah. Uh, the separator changes sort of the state of the extensions parsing because it says, you know, from now on, every, all the extensions you're going to see are going to be associated with frame one. And then you see it again. It's like, oh, now, from now on, it's going to be frame two and so on. Yeah. Okay. So the third one I already mentioned, the um, <clears throat> unsafe thing. Can we uh, get a count of who's read the draft in this case? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it telling you to rotate your laptop? <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. But it is, it's currently work, working for 13 people. <laughs> All right. Okay, that looks like a decent number of people have read the draft considering the count of the participants in the room. Um, do we think that this is, uh, this draft is a useful starting point for working group activity? Let me, let me dismiss that. All right, I'm fighting with the tool here. <laughs> A starting point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I think.
think we saw from discussion that there's you know op opportunities to improve things in it but that's that's not the question so it was 10 right yeah yes <laughs> it, it's 10. Okay. I think we had two more raised hands who weren't even to a couple. Yes. Oh, that's true. So the effective tools, though, if you don't use them once they're in place, you stop existing, it seems. I'm sorry for your lack of existence, Tim. <laughs> I raised my hand because Colin was like, <laughs> no, but normally. Oh, yeah, fair. <laughs> okay, I, I, we can, uh, you know, this this sounds good to me. That I think we can adopt this as a working group uh, draft. But if there's more bashing, it can occur, you know, on the list, as always. Okay, so now we're up for the the next set of slides. Yes. Yeah, and, and for the notes, that was 12 raised hands to, to adopt. Uh, hold on a second while I find slides. Yes. Hmm. Hello. Um, I want to. Uh, present hmm? closer yeah. yeah like this okay right um i want to yeah 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 okay 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 yes okay i got this um yes i want to talk about um speech coding enhancement for um the opus codec so that relates to the second goal of the ml codec charter to improve the quality of speech coding at lower bit rates um there is a corresponding graph which has almost the same name um yeah i should have put this on the title slide but um yeah you will find it i think when i have the next slide yeah. um so the specific method um that uh, i'm proposing um concerns the decoder so it's basically <clears throat> to improve the decoding capability to make the quality of um coded speech better and in the beginning uh, i wanted to give a brief overview over the Opus decoder. There are some um, peculiarities regarding this. So it's a switching codec. It has basically three different modes. So on the left side, you see the CAL decoder. That um, is the MDCT-based um, general audio coding mode. On the right side, there is the SILC decoder. Um, that's the dedicated speech coding mode. And then there is also a thing called hybrid mode, where um, the SILC decoder actually codes the low band and CALT um, codes the high band. And then there is this um, mode handling block down here, which has to either handle transitions or combine the two signals in hybrid mode. Um, and the logical place for adding an enhancement model, module would be, of course, um, directly after um, the SILC decoder. So it would take the distorted speech as input, and it would output a better version of that. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So um, the gen I think one, there one are- One quick question on the previous yes. slide, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so th this precludes any non-voice optimizations? Um, yes, this is uh, specifically about speech mm -hmm. or monophonic signals that might be coded with silk. So it's just about um, improving silk at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, no. Yes. Um, so there are three general challenges. Um, the first one is that um, you can have very heterogeneous inputs um, regarding language, quality, it could be clean speech, noisy speech. Um, but also a lot of the encoder settings are not um, known to the decoder. So um, there is a huge variability and whatever uh, enhancement method is be used has to be able to deal with all of that. Um, 
The second, uh, second thing is um, you've seen, so to say, that this speech coder is embedded into a larger structure. So whenever you change something in the processing chain, um, uh, you have to make sure that it preserves, so to say, the functionality of the decoder, the seamless mode switching, and so on. And you don't want to destroy hybrid mode. Um, and the last one is an interoperability issue. So um, from the specification, the encoder actually has a lot of freedom to encode a valid opus bit stream. And um, there are only recommendations of how to do this. There's the reference implementation. And if you now add an enhancement module to the decoder, then <clears throat> the optimal settings of the en encoder will very likely change. And this means that if you tune now the encoder for a decoder with enhancement uh, included, that would very likely um, degrade the quality when decoding with a legacy decoder. And this is also something to consider. So what is the minimal requirement of um, uh, quality requirement when you decode with a legacy um, Opus decoder? And um, yeah, the next slide. So, um, so this is now one um, proposed method that's um, very recent. Um, it's basically, I mean, <clears throat> doing this kind of enhancement has a long history. Um, it's not surprising that people have been in the same situation. The speech codec is done. How can we make it better? Um, and uh, so this linear adaptive coding enhancer is actually just a supercharged version of these classical methods, which means so on the right-hand side, <clears throat> you see the signal path. And here you just have um, what's traditionally called long-term and short-term filtering. But the difference is that on the left-hand side, you have a rather powerful neural network, which provides filter coefficients to the right-hand side. <clears throat> and for uh, DNNs, it's at the very low um, end of the complexity scale, so it's 100 megaflops. It's still, still very significant for a codec, but um, it's also fairly small with 300k parameters. And if you're interested, so the paper is uh, just made it to the archive. There are also some demo samples to um, look at, and there is Python code for training the model. Um, it's not yet fully integrated into the Opus codec, uh, but you, it's so to say standalone, you can run it. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, John Lennox, are those complexity and model size you're talking about? Is that for encode side, decode side, or both? Um, that's for decoder side. So actually, the it, it's a blind method. So the encoder is not involved. It just runs in the decoder. And yes, that's. Uh, I mean, there's the encoder is not doing anything. The encoder is not doing anything. It's just encoding. So it's it's a blind uh, speech enhancement method. I mean, it's basically like many of the classical speech enhancement methods, which would just do comb filtering and um, remove some interharmonic noise huh. and do some format enhancement. So it's in in this version, it's it's blind. We should think about later um, maybe to use the extension mechanism and to also transmit information for guidance. But the first method um, or the first approach is to do it completely blindly. Yes. Um, okay, so then, so, oh, yeah. some more questions. Yes, please. Mm. Uh, again. So the decoder is more complex than the encoder? In that case, that would be the case, yes. And that's okay. Um, that depends very much on what you are running this on. I think if you're running this on a smartphone or if you're running this on a laptop, that would be completely fine. If you want to run it on, I don't know, an earplug, that's probably not fine. Um, <clears throat> but then it's probably, I mean, it's unlikely that you would uh, want, I mean, it, it would be optional in, in a certain sense. You would not okay. force people to use it. Okay. And I mean, even if you had an earplug, you would probably receive the audio first on uh, a different device that would do the enhancement and then forward this by re-encoding. Yes. Hi, Lalastrom. If I understand you correctly, this is a decode side only. 
So why should anyone care? So um, why should anyone care about it in a standardization context? Uh, that's what I basically said before, so to say. I mean, um, there are these three things you have. I mean, you, I think you need requirements for adding such an enhancement method because it's inside the codec. So it's not something you do at the very end when you collect your output and then you do something, but you are really changing the processing path. And um, so, I mean, the specification should at least um, put together requirements so that when you put something in there and if you call it opus, that it works. So you can break it by adding. I believe so you if mentioned- you, If you enhance the signal- Yes. You are not reproducing the bit pattern on the input. You, you are creating something that has different output from the reference. That seems to be a bit strange. Yes. Uh, Jean-Marc Vallin answering to Harold. Um, you know, essentially right now the spec says <clears throat> these are the test vectors to be compliant. You need to decode exactly that. And so if you, you cannot enhance and be compatible with the existing spec, so we are updating the spec to say, this is the kind of enhancement you're allowed to do. You need to be within these parameters. Uh, for example, at this bit rate or this condition, you should not change the signal by more than this much. Otherwise it might cause compatibility issues. Uh, so we need to clearly define these parameters. Uh, and eventually the intent is to also add some Side, some side information to do better enhancement. So it's gonna be kind of tied together, but otherwise you need to at least clarify if you're doing it blindly to what extent you should modify the signal or not. Just, I'm, I'm all in favor of enhancements. No, don't take me wrong. But uh, we had this with uh, video for H261 or something in, in that, on that order. And uh, the results were that uh, the standards committees ran away screaming in horror and, and uh, settled on a, on a set of test vectors that had to produce an exact match for the output. Mm -hmm. So I'm all in favor of doing this, but I don't understand why it needs to be done and needs to have a standard. Maybe, I mean, we will get uh, to this a little bit. I, I brought you more. back a slide here too, because I think you also yes. raised some points with the encoder behavior may ultimately be changed by some of this, which might have some interoperability impacts that may, may be a consideration. Um, okay, then I think we can go to the next slide. So, I mean, this is now one attempt at um, addressing the um, challenges that I mentioned before. So regarding um, the heterogeneous input, um, what this model does is it's trained on the multilingual data set and there is random switching of bitrate and encoding parameters involved. Um, and so far in the test that performed well, but it definitely needs more um, testing uh, in the future. Um, regarding decoder integrity, um, the strategy for this model was actually to operate with zero delay, so you don't have to adjust any delay in the signal path. And it's also um, trained to be approximately phase preserving. So the, expectation here, uh, the expectation here is that you can just plug it in and all the switching uh, will be fine and hybrid mode will um, still work. Um, but it's not tested yet, so we will, I think we will have an integrated implementation later this year. And then we will see whether this really um, turns out this way and regarding interoperability. So um, I think when you listen to the uh, demo samples, you will understand this a little bit better. So um, here we changed the encoder to do wideband encoding down to six kilobits per second. Usually starting from nine kilobits down, you would do narrow band. And this means basically that if you use a legacy decoder, it sounds worse, but it's still intelligible. 
And the question is, would this be acceptable? Um, yes. Okay. And can I ask the next one? Um, so we also have some some listening test results and another example. So um, in black you see um, the baseline that's just uh, opus at six kilobits, uh, opus wideband uh, at six, nine, and twelve kilobits per second, and the blue line is so to say um, the quality if you add lace. There is also one interesting point in green. Um, this is a LPC net resynthesis method that has been published a few years back. Um, and it's so to say interesting to see that you can actually have uh, quite better quality still. However, the complexity is much higher. It's three gigaflops and it has a 25 millisecond delay. Um, but so to say improving, uh, further improving this LACE model is ongoing um, research and if you go to the repo, there's already a new model, which I think already closes the gap and it's uh, in the middle between. So it would be something like five to six times the complexity of LACE, um, but one fifth of the complexity of the resynthesis method. method. Okay, and what was the next one? Mm. <clears throat> and the final question is um, how to standardize um, if uh, one standardizes this and a very easy way would be to just standardize an enhancement method. Um, however, that could be very quickly uh, outdated. So um, if you fix a model, um, research is going very fast at the moment. Um, that would be very likely inefficient. Also, depending on the application, you might have different um, complexity quality trade-offs. Um, so for some platforms, maybe you can just afford these 100 megaflops, but for a different platform, you don't care whether it's a gigaflop. Um, so the proposal would be to just specify requirements. So what, what are the conditions that you can plug in an enhancement method into the Opus decoder so that it still conforms to the standard? And um, so I think these three points that I mentioned before um, make sense. So the first question is, what um, are the quality uh, requirements uh, for the enhancement model itself when it's run on uh, silk output? Um, what are the requirements to ensure that it doesn't break the decoder? And the third one is, uh, what are the requirements so um, for encoder tuning so that you can still um, operated with uh, legacy Opus decoder. Yes, and I think it's, there's another slide, but yes, yes. okay. <laughs> uh, Mozanetti, I think it's unfortunate that we only had seven minutes and we got to that slide because I think uh, that is by far the biggest issue in this working group. And that could have eaten the entire hour of discussion about how to achieve the right result. Um, so I expect a lot of list discussion or side discussion uh, during this week to try to resolve that point um, because I don't I, I personally don't see a good clear direction for for how to standardize this um, and it'd be good to start really digging into the details of the pros and cons of all all the possible options. Yes, I mean that would be much appreciated. The main idea is of course to get feedback and um, see how other and, and but by your your suggestion to to focus on requirements and, 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 and um, you know, quality parameter specifications. You, you don't mean to in, uh, imply that there'd be a random closed decoder model that, that nobody knows about. As long as it meets the, the requirements, it's, they can use that extension. We still expect people to register or somehow, you know, uh, publish their extensions and how to, how to encode them um, not just that, that they met this quality bar and then they're just opaquely using ID seven to mean my magic, my magic uh, enhancer that nobody else can use, but it meets the quality bar. <laughs> Jean-Marc Vanin quickly. Um, <clears throat> the idea is the quality bar would be only for the uh, no side information case. So you can always receive something and the intent is definitely to publish the model, but we want to make it possible for people to have like better things. Like we don't want to freeze a model and you can never change it. 
Um, but you know, compatibility is the very first criterion. So if you actually signal bits, then we're going to clearly define what these bits are. Like we don't want exactly the case you're you're describing. That that is uh, the top priority to avoid that. Uh, <clears throat> so at six kilobits per second, the the most call is better, but it's still low. Um, for, and at, at 12, it's about the same. Um, uh, yes, I mean, you, you mean regarding the... On this chart, the, the blue one, which is yes. lace, at 12 kilobits, it's about the same most call. Um, it, the improvement for this model is not huge at um, 9 or 12, but the next generation model is much better at this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so it's 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 very compressed. I mean, between baseline and yes. lace, it looked the same, except that there's and a 25 millisecond delay. You can't get muscle yes, I yeah. mean it, it, for, it's for statistically. Yeah, but it's yeah. so close. That but it, it's is statistically it it? yes. I mean, okay. it's statistically significant. That's one thing. You can also listen to it. It's it's audible if you listen with headphones, but the difference is not huge. That's clear. However. Okay. As I said, so to say, this lace is really <clears throat> an experiment. How low can you go in complexity? It operates at the very low oh, scale. I'm afraid. Yes, you, you make, so to say, the um, complexity re requirements a little bit uh, looser and you get more improvements. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to keep pressing forward every 10 yep. seconds. <laughs> so, <clears throat> presenting deep redundancy very quickly. Um, <clears throat> that's the you know general goal: make Opus robust to lots of packet loss. We can get up to 50 passed frames into one packet with about 32 kilobits per second, which means we can get up to one second worth of redundancy. Um, this is generally how it's done. We have the in blue the main opus encoder and decoder. We add on the encoder side some feature extraction. We compress those features very heavily with a machine learning based model. And on the decoder side, when we've lost previous packets, then we can actually decode that uh, redundancy using a feature decoder. And then we have these features, we send them to a neural vocoder and we recover the audio. Next. Um, the way this is done, uh, it looks a bit confusing, but there's a good reason for that. We have this forward backward scheme where, you know, we don't, we have 50x redundancy. We don't want the encoder to encode every single frames 50 times because that would be insanely complex. So we have an encoder that just runs forward and every 20 milliseconds, it produces so-called latent vectors that represent 40 milliseconds. So there's a 50% overlap. It also creates these um, in, uh, initial states that I'll explain a bit later. Uh, no, sorry, I go back just <laughs> uh, essentially. And then on the encoder side, what happens is you take, because there's 50% overlap, you take all the odd ones or all the even ones, you pack them. This would be here one, um, <clears throat> one packet that would be sent. It would have all the latent vectors and it would have one initial state. And the way the decoder works when it wants to recover that information, it starts from the initial state and it decodes backwards in time. And the idea for decoding backwards in time is the most recent packets are typically the most useful. It's gonna be very rare that you want the frame from one second ago, but the frame from 20 milliseconds ago is gonna be quite common. So decoder goes backwards in time. Next. Um, Uh, François Nguyen, so in, in the audio stream, if you miss one second, when you get the data back, you have to start replaying it at a faster speed or something? Yes, the, the way you would practically use it, 
is indeed you get the data back, you decode the entire thing, and then you play with a one second delay and eventually your data buffer, you play it faster and it eventually catches up. Uh, essentially that when you have dread, then losing packets becomes, you, you end up with the same scenario as if your router had just piled up a full second of packet and released them all at the same time. So, okay. you know, it's not great. You still get a hole and things play back for faster, but at least you actually understand what the person said instead of leaving a big hole. Um, so these I presented, uh, the dispatch meeting, I think some of you were there, essentially bottom line is if you combine the original Opus LBRR with Dread, you can actually get with pa uh, packet loss no longer than one second, uh, you actually get very close to the clean quality. Um, disregarding this whole jitter buffer thing, assuming the jitter buffer was already at one second. Next slide. Um, so there's a proposed format. I don't think there's much time to go over it. Um, uh, I suggest you read the draft. We define a bunch of fields there. I'd be very um, happy to get feedback on uh, whether these are useful, if there's anything we missed. Uh, essentially, you know, and discuss the latent features, the uh, initial state. And the rest is stuff like, you know, what kind of quantizer, what kind of bit rate you want to use and the, these sorts of things. Next slide. Um, in terms of the normative aspect, so there's again, this balancing act of ensuring everything is interoperable, but leaving as much flexibility as possible because, you know, machine learning is improving very fast and <clears throat> The idea right now would be to have a normative spec for the decoder weights. So the part that takes the bits and gives you these acoustic features. And we would need to somehow define precisely the, what these acoustic feature means. But from there on, we would leave the encoder um, completely free. And also the vocoder that turns the acoustic features into audio, uh, we want you know, implementers to be able to improve those over time because we have something right now uh, with LPC net. We're in the process of replacing that with something much better. And I fully expect in a few years, there's gonna be something even better, higher quality, lower complexity. So we don't want to uh, restrict ourselves, but we still need to keep this decoder the same so that everything is interoperable. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> So running code, we have all of Dread is actually currently running in Opus. If you get the Opus code in the Opus NG branch, you can test it out. It's usable. Uh, it's got a few rough edges, um, improvements or suggestions, bug reports, welcome. Uh, complexity is about five to 10%. We're working on reducing that by maybe half, we think it's possible, something like that. Uh, Jonathan Lennox, I also heard, I guess, a rumor that this also was like increased to the library size by like 10 megabytes or something like that. So right now, the current implementation will increase by about 17 megabytes. We've not, um, it's still not optimized for size. Uh, we're in the process of trying to reduce that to probably two to four megabytes. Uh, it's going to be a challenge to try and go really below that, but I think two to four is kind of uh, what we think is achievable with similar or better quality. And we already have a mechanism to have these weights completely separate from the library. So you can ship the library and have the weights uh, sent, you know, only when needed or in a separate channel or something like that. Uh, Colin, just a slight bit of feedback on that. I mean, uh, that's, I, I'm sure you'll get it way down or whatever, but even like 17 megs was like, that's less of a big deal to me than in the 10%. Like that's, that's in the workable category as far, as far as I'm concerned, if we're talking on arm or something like that. So um, I, I, I guess like, sure, let's keep working on this or whatever, but that didn't explode my head. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, so we're still open to feedback about a bunch of questions, including, you know, what is the maximum duration that we think is reasonable? Right now, we've been centering around one second really arbitrarily. Like, is, like, are there use cases for, like, two seconds, five seconds, 15 minutes? I don't know. Uh, so, you know, get, getting an idea of what what is the upper bound of what's potentially useful is probably good. Um, and same thing for, you know, the lowest and highest useful bit rates there. You know, right now we have this one use case that seems reasonable to us, but we've not tried it too much in the wild. So definitely feedback is welcome there. All right. Thank you. Do you have more comments on that? If not, no. I mean, on Jonathan, it's a general concept on the whole thing. My, I have one worry, and this, maybe this needs to be in somewhere in the security considerations or something. As, as far as I know, almost all ML models can be have adversarial input. And do we have to worry about adversarial input? Because I could certainly imagine, I mean, this is just sort of off the top of my head, but I could certainly imagine if you, you, know, you could send a signal which people with the new Opus decoder here is yes, and people with the old Opus decoder here is no. Um, that's there's probably interesting things you could do with that. So that's interesting. I mean, the, the only way that could happen, if you could control the loss, then indeed you would be able. Yeah. Oh, with, with the other one, the whole idea of the spec is to ensure that this is not possible to, to turn a, yo, a no into a yes. Um, with dread, technically, like you could, and you could have redundancy for yes transmit no and then if trivial. the packets exactly. get the packet loss gets aligned you could turn one into the other uh it's kind of an interesting one i don't know how to fix that one <laughs> yeah this has also been a problem for multi-party chat protocols of run into this equivalency issue uh, I, I mean it, it, assuming your model came from a truck like, like yours it, it, i mean the model won't do it right the, the model won't do it by itself right yeah. and then the streams are all authenticated. Yeah. I'm not really seeing an attack here yet. I'm, it, I'm sure yeah. I'm just being dumb. I'm the, not following it. A, a server could also just replace the stream entirely for some clients. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. You're, it, the only attack case that uses here is one where the base stream with Opus today could the yes could be changed to a no. Is that? I mean, the, the only case I can think of is I encode my like on my side, I put in a yes in the dread and simultaneously encode no in the main Opus packet. And then somehow I cause packet loss on your side so you get dread and not on his. I mean, it's kind of far-fetched, but theoretically possible. Yeah. Yeah. But there's probably bigger problems than yeah, that. <laughs> it's a good thing to the, discuss. Uh, the, the general sort of, you know, this would have to be obviously in a conference, but I sort of think like, you know, the, the underling here is yes and the auditor here is no. And, and ask whether they should do something, so. Um, yeah, and I think that's more probably a problem for, I mean, I know that the, the, your, the specification says for the enhancement that can't happen, but I do we, we can ensure when we train the model that it can't happen. Are you sure that, you, that the adversary, I mean, there's no you, you, adversarial you, input that could do it? I mean, you can, that's also something to discuss, but yeah. it, we could have like some part of this decoder thing where you get the model and then you compare, oh, yeah. you so see how much like change it did. And if it's too much, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going so, so it's having something after the ML model that sort of yeah. validates. So that, that, that makes sense. You could have, this is all definitely stuff that we want feedback on and that we, we want to make sure this is not possible. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Say yes very quickly. Yes. Oh, you were talking about four, right?